That's perfect timing, almost like we planned it, right? <laughs> All right, so good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our service of worship on this uh, drizzly but uh, gorgeous Sunday morning. It's always a good day to be gathered to worship God, and we're so grateful that you have chosen to be with us this morning. We have a few announcements uh, to uh, start us off uh, before we begin our worship time together, and the first of which is if, uh, if you're sitting here near the middle of the church, you, you might be sitting uh, either on or near a clipboard. If you would grab a hold of that clipboard and fill out some information there for us and send that on down the pew, that's a great way to let us know that you're here and uh, help us kind of keep tabs on folks. It's also a great way for you to communicate with the uh, front office. If you have a change in your address or phone number or email or whatever, you can put that right on there and we can update your, uh, your uh, computer file with us so you're sure to get all of the information about everything that happens around here. So check that out as well. If you're a visitor, you can sign up there. We have welcome packets. Don't forget to grab one of those on your way out if you'd like to know more about our congregation and all that we, uh, all that we do around here. There's also prayer cards tucked into the back of those clipboards as they come by, and we have a time in our service where we do lift up our joys and concerns. Uh, we'll send around a microphone that you might share it with all of us, uh, but we do recognize that that's not always the most comfortable or appropriate way for you to share your prayer request, and so if you would uh, like to take advantage of that, grab one of those cards and fill it out. Uh, you can get it to me on your way out. You can just plop that right in the offering plate as it comes by uh, later on in our service, or you can hand it to one of our uh, youth who are uh, faithfully ushering for us today, and uh, we'll be sure to keep you in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, we'll put that in our prayer chain and, and take that uh, very seriously. We'll take our prayer ministry here uh, incredibly seriously, and we'd love the, the opportunity and privilege to pray for you if, if that's a, a need for you. We also want to have you, if you, haven't, uh, if you happen to have a smartphone and a Facebook app, you can check in on Facebook here with us and uh, let everybody in your uh, friend's feed know that uh, uh, this is a great place to worship God and help us get the word out about that as well. Now, we have a, a few announcements, things coming up this week we want to let you know about uh, as we begin our, our service today. Uh, we've got a fellowship time right after the uh, uh, worship this morning. And I was going to tell you that we have totes to pack. We are going to uh, do this new uh, thing. The totes are uh, these bags of food we take to the elementary schools here in the Brighton community. And uh, those go to uh, students who don't have enough food to eat on the weekends. And they get them on Friday so that they have food for the weekend so they can come back to school on Monday uh, refreshed and ready to learn. And uh, that's a ministry we've been doing here for several years. Uh, and our youth are normally the uh, dutiful uh, crew to pack those bags that they are ready so they're ready to go and, and deliver to the schools uh, but because they help us so diligently every fourth Sunday of the month here in the midst of worship uh, administrative council came up with the idea that on those Sundays we would invite you to help them pack the totes instead uh, and during the fellowship time and then of course I looked back there before the service began and uh, they've already got the totes packed so uh, we are going to help them bless the totes on their way uh, after. So, so join us in Fellowship Hall. We'll, we'll do a blessing over the totes, pray over them, uh, that they might uh, feed bellies and fuel hearts and, uh, and uh, uh, kindle faith for those young people. Uh, but uh, while you're also back there, you'll notice I'm told quite the spread for our fellowship time today. And that is uh, uh, provided by, I'm going to butcher it again, Susan. I'm sorry, Susan Makarovich. Ah, I got it. There you go. Susan McCarrick, in honor uh, and celebration of her son Adam's birthday coming up this week. So uh, take advantage of that. Find Susan and, and thank her and uh, wish Adam a happy birthday. And we'd love to have you join us in fellowship time. Grab yourself a cup of coffee and maybe some goodies and enjoy that time together. And we'll bless the, the totes. We also want to invite you this Wednesday. We've got a big Wednesday coming up. This Wednesday at 6.20. Any morning people here? Uh, that's 6.20 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we are going to meet at the flagpole at Brighton High School uh, for See You at the Pole. This is a, a nationwide uh, call to prayer. It will be led by the teenagers that show up. It can't be led by students or faculty or even us. Uh, but if you want to come out and support those uh, teenagers who are going to be there at the pole uh, to pray uh, over their school and over their school year, see you at the pole. We're going to meet at 620. Uh, we'll pray about 630 as they get uh, ready to ramp up in their day. Uh, so join us to support those young people in our community and, and just shower and cover our community and especially our, uh, our young people in prayer on Wednesday, this Wednesday, 620. Uh, and if you don't know where the flagpole is, it's right here on 8th Avenue. So it's just up the street from us. You see it, there's a little uh, visitor parking right there and the, the flag is right there. So join us uh, on Wednesday for that. 
We also, if you haven't noticed, we have quite the rainbow of colors uh, adorning our front here. These are our prayer shawls. Uh, we've got uh, we've got a small army of uh, crocheters and knitters. I don't know the difference, but I'm sure they do. Uh, who make these prayer shawls? These are uh, these are uh, wraps that can be used uh, in the midst of uh, prayer time. Can be comforting and remind us of God's presence. Uh, especially when we need it the most. And so uh, they have been making these prayer shawls, and when they make them, they bring them here, and we put them in a, in a cozy uh, cupboard, never to be seen by uh, man or beast again. And uh, that is a shame, and so we are uh, putting them out in front of you. We're going to pray over these shawls later in the service, and uh, then you'll be invited. If you know of somebody who needs one, if you are somebody who needs one, you're welcome to, to take and grab those. Uh, and uh, we thank all of those who have contributed to the prayer shawl ministry over the years. Uh, there's also information about them, uh, what they are, what they mean, the different colors have different meanings, I'm told, all kinds of things that uh, go into the prayer shawl. So uh, there'll be more about that as we come up, but just wanted to mention them here and, and encourage you after the service, if you have need or know of somebody who needs a prayer shawl, uh, to take one and, and uh, let them be uh, a blessing to someone. Now we are constantly growing as the disciples of Jesus Christ, amen? That's not just something I say every Sunday. That's something we live out as we uh, seek to uh, find God in our everyday lives and, and put our discipleship into action. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't found your way into a Bible study or a, a, a small group or a prayer ministry or a Sunday school class or something, uh, get connected with a group. Uh, grow, uh, get growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we have opportunities that, uh, that dot our entire week. Uh, we've got Sunday school classes after fellowship time today. Uh, yes, we can do Sunday school and uh, uh, go home and watch the DVR Bronco game because I know it starts early. But we got Sunday school this morning, so uh, join us for, for one of our adult classes and kids, of course, and youth. We also have Bible studies and prayer groups that meet throughout the week. And a reminder, uh, we'll be picking up the uh, Acts Bible study this Tuesday, 9 o'clock. So join us in the library if you'd like to uh, pick up where we're, where we're at in Acts. We'd love to have you join us for that. We also want to mention United Methodist Youth Fellowship, going to uh, meet again at 4 o'clock today. I'm told they're going to be watching a movie and uh, discussing, so come and, and join us. Uh, all youth, 6th to 12th grade, are invited to join uh, United Methodist Youth Fellowship at 4. Uh, we also want to encourage you, if you would like to go even deeper in your faith walk, deeper in your exploration of uh, what it could mean for you to uh, be in ministry here in this place, uh, to think about doing the lay servant ministry training that's coming up in our district. Uh, that's going to be on uh, two consecutive Saturdays, October the 7th and the 14th at uh, First United Methodist Church in Loveland. Uh, there's a basic course. There's advanced training for those of you who have taken the basic course. want to encourage you, if you haven't done that or you'd like to know more about it, to find me after the service. I'd love to talk to you about uh, how that can bless uh, your ministry and encourage you, uh, but uh, be looking for that as well. Uh, the United Methodist Women have a busy weekend coming up. They are going to be hosting right here in our, uh, in our uh, church building, the District United Methodist Women uh, for uh, the Peaks and Plains District. That's going to be this Saturday. It's still not too late, I'm told, to sign up if you'd like to join uh, them for that and uh, be, doing, uh, be looking forward to that as well. And then the following Saturday, they are going to be gathering uh, here to go over to Bromley Farm for a tour tour. Uh, uh, that will take place uh, as uh, their usual meeting on the first Saturday of the month. So if you'd like to join them for Bromley Farm, they'll meet here at 930, and there's also a sign-up for that in Fellowship Hall. And I'm told that if you have uh, 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 still desire to bring uh, socks and underwear for uh, school-aged children who are getting ready for now starting school, but it's never too late to give them a, a hand with uh, some clean socks and underwear uh, to start the school year off right, if you'd like to do that, we'd love to have you do that by next Sunday. Uh, so this is the final week for that. And uh, uh, I'm told that there's a special need for uh, uh, underwear for young boys. Uh, we've got the others uh, more evenly covered. So if you're, if you're out there and you're wondering what do they need, that's what we need. Uh, come and bring those the next Sunday uh, that we can get those to the kids and bless them. With that, let us greet each other in the peace and love of Christ as we begin our worship service this morning. <laughs>
Good morning, Bob. Morning there, Bob. How are you? How are you? Doing well. Good to see you. be seated. And as we enter into this sacred time of worship, I invite you to join with me in uh, the call to worship that's printed in your bulletin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The Lord is in the holy temple. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come before you that we might be encouraged in our faith. We come to this place that we might experience your holy presence afresh this morning, Lord. That your Holy Spirit would come into our hearts and overflow us. That your love would pour out over our edges into this world, that your grace would seep out of our lives and into those around us. Lord, we pray for your presence to meet us here, for we know you may be everywhere, but we know for certain that you are here. Meet us in this place afresh, O Lord. Come into our hearts that they might be strangely warmed. Come into our minds that they might be invigorated and inspired. Take hold of our lives, Lord. Transform us to your glory that we might honor you with our lives. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' powerful and precious name. Amen. i 
Can I have the children join me down front for just a bit? Good morning. So, before we get started with what's in the box, uh, we're going to do the blessing of the totes now, so that we don't have much of a cluster after church. Uh, so I have here one of the totes. It's a Walmart bag, bubble stuffed, simple, basic like that. Uh, so, will everyone please join me in an attitude of prayer? Oh Lord, we thank you for today and we thank you for our ability to feed other people. We hope that we can provide for them the necessary food so that they can be not hungry as they continue their education in elementary school. We hope that they use this food to grow stronger and have a better life in the future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right. So, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. I know what's in the box. <laughs> the certain person that brought the item ran up to me and was like, hey, look at this. And he's like, hey, you know that I'm actually doing what's in the box. <laughs> so I'm going to let you all guess what's in the box. Does anyone have any idea? No? Oh, you're just, you're just not answering because a unicorn? Cody says a unicorn. Mm. <laughs> All right, you want to take a look? Oh, oh, it's one of the trolls from the Trolls movie. So, I've heard that it sings. How do you turn the singing on? It's on the foot. It's on the foot? Oh, it's on the hand. I don't know if that's picking it up. I don't, I don't recognize the song, but it's a very happy song. All right. Pretty groovy. Got to catch a tune. So do any of you have any ideas of your own on how... Oh, you got one? God makes us happy like Poppy makes us happy. God makes us happy like uh, Poppy makes us happy. That's a good one. Very good one. Very excellent point. Are there any other ideas? Well, considering there are uh, ooh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven youth members, I'm disappointed we don't have any other ideas. <laughs> they don't want to steal mine. So you have another one? She has a smelly belly. It smells like candy. It does. It smells like cotton candy. <laughs> wow. And she has very poofy hair. So if there are no other ideas, I'm going to drop the hottest metaphor of 2017, because I've been thinking of this one. All right? So I have in my patch a box pouch, a box of matches. Right? So, sometimes there are people in the world that are like, this burns out match. This person could be named someone like Branch, the main, char the main character of the movie Trolls, who has a lot of sadness in them, and is kind of burnt out, doesn't have a lot of God's light. Right? Branch in the movie is very sad, doesn't have a lot of light in him, if you haven't seen the movie. I mean, I haven't. But. Sometimes, you need a person that has a lot of light to come along, and let's see if I can pull this off real fast. I can't, man. I'm gonna set the church on fire. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> So 
sometimes you just need another person like Miss Poppy over here. Poppy? Is that her name? Yeah. Thank you. To come along and light your fire so that you can be happy and burn for God. Good job. So, does anyone want to bring next week? Oh, we only have one volunteer. That makes it. Oh, two. Oh. Mm. Ooh, one of the two siblings. I got, I got you. Uh, you're going to be here next week? You got Joel? Stump him. Make, make him cry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, shall we bow our heads in prayer? Oh, Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the toasts again, because they're very good. We hope that as we continue in our future, if we ever feel down and feel like we need some help, that someone will come along and light our fire. Or that if we see someone who needs their fire lit, we can help them. Every time we see a match, we can think of how we need assistance. Or every time we watch the movie Trolls, we can think of how other people need assistance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget your kill. You guys can go to Children's Church or back to your families. start while you do that. Um, so I have um, a joy, but also I wanted to say something about the prayer shawls and that my um, parents have one. My dad has leukemia, my mom has Parkinson's, and um, my mom keeps it on her chair all the time and feels comfort from it. And when she has to go to the hospital, she takes it with her. So it's a great ministry. Um, but I wanted to say prayers for Dylan. So he's starting a couple of projects at school. Don't grill him about it because he'll be embarrassed. But I just want to ask prayers for him because he's, he's nervous and excited. And um, so that was that. And the only reason he's in the theater program at all and loves it so much is for your support um, when he was doing his skits and playing with the kids. And that really led him to something that he loves. My name's John Dixon, and I have a great joy. Kathy and I celebrated 20 years last Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> we had a little bit of a scare on Thursday when Cody took a bad hit to the back of the head, um, but he was cleared, or cleared of concussion, so he's back at football on Monday. Hi, my name's Caitlin Dixon. Going off of Carrie's thing with theater, the Brighton High School actually has a drama performance this weekend on Friday and Saturday, and it's at 7 o'clock p.m., and it's called the Spoon River Project, so I'd really love it if you guys could show up and help support the drama program. Thank you. I'd like to have prayers for my great-grandson, Bryce. He has an abscess tooth, and he's hoping he's going to be able to play football Monday. I don't know, but we're going to pray for it anyway. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Dixon, and um, my father had some heart trouble this um, past summer. I know most of you already know, but um, he turns 76 on this coming Sunday, um, but he had a little bit of a medication confusion, I guess, 
So um, it's kind of took a toll on him. He's real down and um, hasn't been feeling well. So if you could pray for my dad, Ralph, that would be great. I'm Marilyn Ames. I know that we're all praying for all of our hurricane victims, Puerto Rico and, and Texas and Florida. But I'd like to ask for some special prayers. I have a cousin, uh, Diana, her daughter Danny, her husband and son, and we have not heard from them since the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Um, I know all communications are down, but the area that they are in, we believe the eye went right over where they are. So we're very, very concerned and hopeful that we'll get some kind of a message soon. So prayers for them and everyone else. Thank you. I'm Al Fraley, and um, our grandson, who's very breakable apparently, has now broken his right uh, thumb and cast up his arm, and uh, his football career is over for <laughs> this year. Good morning, I'm Kathy Fiscus, and my brother is dealing with some health concerns. His name is Ken West, and if you could just lift him up in healing prayers, thank you. Gracious and loving God, we lift up our prayers to you today in Jesus' powerful and precious name. And we come to this time of prayer, Lord, knowing that we cannot handle it all. But Lord, help us to realize that apart from you, we can handle nothing at all. We thank you for this and all of the times in our life when we have felt your presence, empowering us and guiding us, spurring us onward. And Lord, we repent of those times when we let the storm seem bigger than you. When we forget that your presence is there. And we turn to ourselves. Lord, we lift up these joys before you today. the celebration of milestones. The joy of seeing your ministries impact the people around us. And all the ways that you have used and continue to use us to build your kingdom in this world. Lord, we thank you for new opportunities, and we ask that you would continue to be present with us as we live out those opportunities. We give you thanks for healing, for fellowship, for the love that you kindle in our hearts that we dare to share with each other. Lord, overflow our lives 
that your powerful presence would not just be felt in these walls, but wherever we are. That your presence would overflow us into the people in our everyday lives. And Lord, for these concerns that we have voiced here in your presence, we give them over to you, Lord. We pray for healing. We pray for safety. We pray for the peace that comes in knowing our loved ones are safe. We pray for all of those who do not have that comfort, that they would find it in you, that you would bring a peace that passes all understanding, even in the midst of these tragedies, these storms, these stories upon stories that we've heard. Lord, we give all of these things to you. Sometimes we're bad at it, but we give them over to you in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The one who taught us how to live. And the one who who continually shows us how to love, and the one who brings us together as we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our prayer response is, Lord of all hopefulness. It's hymn number 2197. These are new words to a familiar tune. So let us join our voices together.
Thanks be to God. Grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ our Lord. I just want to say how marvelous it is to have our youth uh, participating even uh, more and more in the leadership of our worship on these fourth Sundays, and it's so great to look back and see the entire back pew crammed with teenagers. Just love that. Uh, that's awesome. So much fun. Now, uh, I want to invite you, if you haven't already, uh, to open your Bible to, uh, to Mark chapter 4. We were in John chapter 4 last week. It only struck me this morning as I was flipping the pages of the uh, altar uh, Bible here, uh, that, that now we're in Mark 4, so there's some synergy there, but uh, uh, if you don't have a copy of your, if you don't have a, a Bible in hand, if you didn't bring yours with you, I want to encourage you to do that next time you join us, because we're always digging into the Word together, but uh, if you didn't bring yours, don't worry, we got you covered, you know, grab that Bible in the front, get your eyes on a copy, if it's not your copy, and if you don't have a copy of God's Word to go home to today, I want to make sure that we change that. Uh, before the day is out. And so we've got uh, a couple of tables uh, around the church that have stacks of Bibles on them. We want to make sure that you get home with a copy of God's Word this morning. So we're in this series, and this is now week three, where this will be the halfway point in this series I'm calling Come to the Altar. Uh, Come to the Altar. Jesus taught us that the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. These six weeks to begin our fall series, uh, Come to the Altar, are about learning to love God. And we begin to love God by seeking His presence. By seeking His presence. We're working on trying to, we talked about this the first week, that it's not about us. We're trying to take us out of the center of the equation and put God in the center of our lives. It's not about us. We must refocus the purpose of our entire lives around God's presence. And I I have to tell you, you'll hear more about this, but I have experienced this in the last several days as I've been traveling to and from Nashville in a whole new way. In a whole new way. We have to reorient our lives around the presence of God. And then last week we talked about hunger and thirsting for God's presence. It's not just enough to know we should have it. It's not just enough to come here and expect it. It's that the Lord wants to draw out of us a hunger and a thirst for God's presence. We talked about the sort of backwards, upside-down world of the kingdom of God last week, that, that in the natural world we get hungry and we are thirsty because of a lack of, of eating and drinking, right? We, we get hungry and thirsty by not eating and drinking, but the upside down, backwards world of the kingdom of God is that the more we experience God's presence, the more hungry, the more thirsty we are to experience it again. It draws us in. It creates in us that hunger, that thirst for God's presence. Today I want to talk about the overwhelming nature, that overflowing presence of God. Are you with me? All right, the overflowing presence of God. When are, I want you to think about this for just a moment. When are you most likely to know you need God's presence? When are you most likely to recognize for yourself that you need God's presence? Well, the short answer is the storm. The short answer is the storm. And it occurred to me, as Marilyn was lifting up her prayer request this morning, that there is probably no more appropriate time for us to be looking at Jesus calming the storm as we've seen storm after storm barreling in from the Atlantic Ocean and bearing down on people. The time we are most likely to recognize that we need God's presence is when we're in the midst of the storm. Now, the problem with that is when are we most likely to abandon God's presence? In the midst of the storm. In the midst of the storm. That's the funny thing is that the one time we need it is the one time we forget to look for it. 
because we haven't cultivated it all along the way. You see, it's not enough for us to turn to God and say, God, I have shipwrecked my life on the coast of this problem, and I don't know what to do. That's usually the time we eventually end up turning, but that's the wrong time for us to be turning to the Lord. We need to be about cultivating the presence of God so that God is present with us always and everywhere, that we feel it, that we know it, that we seek it, we hunger and thirst for it, so that when the storm comes, when the storm comes, we don't have to go looking. We don't have to scramble around because that presence is already cultivated. We've already, we've already used those spiritual muscles, if you will. I want you to just look at this story of Jesus calming the storm. It's one we've all heard rather frequently, right? And it's one we maybe even recall in the midst of our own personal storm, whatever that might look like. But I want to unpack this story for just a moment and, and, and show you a couple of things. In verse 35, it starts, On that day when evening had come, we'll get to the day earlier, we'll get to that in a minute. But on that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. So this was Jesus' boat with the disciples, and there were some other boats coming along. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. Already being swamped. I want to just point out to you for just a moment, just in case we forgot, that the guys that Jesus are with, these disciples that are gathered around him, that are working the boat, these are not novice boat people. These are experienced fishermen. They would have lived the better part of their lives on the water. These are people who have seen it all. These are guys who would know what to do when the storm comes and you're on the water. If you were to be with anybody in the midst of a storm on a sea like this, in a boat like this, you would want these guys around you because they would be the most capable human beings you could ever ask for in this situation. Okay? So just keep that in mind. This, this isn't like me out there in a boat going, okay, this is not a good plan. I don't know what, what to do. These guys would have known what to do. These guys would have exhausted all that they had known what to do, right? Before panicking, they would have been about making sure it all happens, making sure that everything that could be done had been done. These were seasoned fishermen, these disciples. And so their panic gives us a couple of clues. First of all, it clues us into just how big this storm is. This wasn't just like, oh, we got some... We've got some choppy seas here. This is a big storm, all right? This is no small sort of like wind event, okay? This isn't like a little, uh, a little storm blowing through. No, this is a big deal because it's overwhelmed these seasoned fishermen and all of their skills to the point that they begin to panic. They begin to panic. Here's the thing is the first thing that turns us away from God's presence the first thing that turns us away from God's presence and the thing that most persistently turns us away from God's presence is our own competence. Some of you got that. Let me try it one more time, okay? Got a couple of chuckles there, okay? The first and the primary and the most consistent thing that turns us away from God's presence is our own competence. Amen? Right? It's our own competence. It's our own sense that we can do it. I got this problem. Oh, there's a problem here. I got that. Let me tell you, okay, I've been, I've been working. Some of you have heard my stories about my truck. <laughs> Bertha has been uh, quite a challenge recently, all right? That's my truck's name, by the way, Bertha. I got a 21-year-old truck, and let me tell you, she's showing her age a little bit, and she needed some, some new parts, and, and some of the things were a challenge to me. Now, it was fascinating to me. Of all the things I had to do on my truck most recently one thing that took absolutely no time at all, I'm talking like 10 minutes of the three days I spent working on my truck, were my brakes. And it's because I have done brakes 
about a half dozen times on this truck over the years. I could do the brakes on this truck in my sleep because I have a competence in doing brakes. Now, I've discovered the edges of my competency. I'm going to tell you what, OK? Uh, there were some times where uh, I was losing some religion in my garage, OK? Let me just tell you what. And there was some praying going on in the midst of that, let me tell you. But, but when we know how to do something, we don't lean on the Lord to help us do it. When we think we have the answer to solve the problem, we don't lean on the Lord to help us accomplish it. Think about this. How many of you think that with great confidence, we, in our own competency, are confident that we could make the Totes for Hope ministry happen? We could make that happen. How hard is that, right? We work with the state to get the food. We bring the food here. Then we pack the food. Then we deliver the food. And the kids eat. And our goal is accomplished. We don't, hear me now, we don't need God to do the Totes for Hope. Now, if we want those totes to go out into this world and do more than feed bellies, but feed spirits and feed souls and provide an opportunity for people to come to know Christ, if we want that to happen because of those totes, I think that might be a little bit more beyond our competency, right? But the problem is, is so often we'll stop short at our competency. We won't rely on the Lord. Now, the real problem, you're all seeing it now, I hope, the real problem is when we come up against something for which we do not have the solution. That's what the storms are. The storms are when we come up against something where our competency isn't helping. That's where these fishermen are. That's where these disciples have found themselves. They're in the midst of a storm that they've seen storms before. They're, on a, they're in a boat on the water. That's not new territory for them. They've got the competency to deal with that. But this storm is unlike anything they've experienced. This storm goes beyond their competency. And so they begin to panic. What happens in ministry when something happens that is beyond our competence? That's the first thing that turns us away from God's presence when we say, we can handle it. We got this, God. We'll, we'll check back in you with you when... You know, when we come up against something we don't know how to do. But that's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to reorient our entire lives around the presence of the Lord. To camp around God's presence. We can't let competency separate us from the presence of God. Distract our attention and place our faith in ourselves instead of the Lord. Now, I love this, this passage because so these fishermen are, are beyond their capacity to deal with this storm. And we can all agree they've had a, they have a great capacity to deal with this kind of thing. But they are well beyond it. And as far gone as they are, Jesus is dwelling in God's presence. You know how I know that? Because he's asleep in the boat. He's asleep in the boat. Right? Check this out. The great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was, check this out, already being swamped. Already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. I don't care how comfortable that cushion was. If the boat is being swamped because the storm is so big and these fishermen can't handle it, I think I'd have a, a trouble sleeping. I'm just saying. I think at the very least I'd wake up and be like, Wow, there's a storm, right? But no, Jesus is asleep in the boat as a demonstration of just how much peace can come even in the midst of a storm when our focus is the presence of God. And they come to him and they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? What a strange question for Jesus, isn't it? I was, that just always struck me. I'm, I'm sorry. Just Here's the thing, though. So Jesus is asleep. He's just not kicking back. He's just not saying, don't worry, we got this, you know. He is asleep. Now, here's some things that, to think about. 
here's some things to think about when it comes to sleep. Of all the ways that Jesus could demonstrate his peace in the midst of this storm, he's asleep, and I think that's intentional. Because, you see, sleeping means he's unable to physically or consciously do anything. You feel me? He isn't just relaxed. He isn't just obviously calm, you know, like some sort of holy man praying in the bow of the boat. He is asleep. Therefore, he cannot consciously, physically do anything about that storm. This is a demonstration of his complete and total reliance on God and God's presence in that moment. He could do nothing, relying entirely on the presence of God in the midst of that storm. That's the only way he could be asleep. The only way he could be asleep. Now see, peace, the kind of peace that passes our understanding, or I might say it a different way, the peace that goes beyond our competency, peace beyond our ability to manufacture it, that kind of peace is a side effect of God's presence. It's a side effect of God's presence. You see, when you know that God's got it, then you stop worrying about it. When you know that God's got it, you stop worrying about it. If you're still worrying about it, then you're still hanging on to some of it. Now, that's kind of a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, including myself. Right? If you're still worrying about it, that means you're still holding on to some of it. Because the side effect of God's presence is a peace that goes beyond our competency, you see. That peace that passes all understanding. Jesus is so filled with God's presence at that moment that he doesn't feel the need to exhaust his human capabilities before leaning on God. He doesn't feel the need to exhaust those human capabilities. Now you might say that's easy for Jesus, he's... The God-man, right? Right? He's the God-man. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, God from God, right? But you see, here's the thing. I've said this to you before, but this, this thought still blows my mind. It just totally blows my mind. When we think about, okay, if Jesus does these marvelous things, and if you read earlier on in Mark's gospel, there's plenty of reason for the disciples to believe that Jesus could do some pretty awesome things, okay? He's already done some awesome healings. He's done some marvelous teaching. He's, he's done some stuff. They, they recognize he has a power that they don't have access to yet. Now, if Jesus does all of those things as God, I'm impressed, but I'm not encouraged to do it myself. I'm impressed, I marvel, but I'm not encouraged to do it myself. But you see, I want you to think about this for just a moment. You see, Jesus leaves the throne and becomes a man. Jesus leaves the Godhead and becomes one of us. Not to demonstrate how awesome God could do if he was wearing a, God, uh, a man suit, right? Not to, not to impress us with how much God could do if God were to appear as one of us, but actually be as one of us. The model for what we could become in perfect relationship with God. When we get this presence thing right, when we get this relationship with God thing right, there is no limit to what we can do in partnership with God. You see, Jesus comes, leaves the throne room as a man, not to demonstrate how awesome God could do if he looked like us, but how awesome we could do in the midst of of a perfect relationship with God. If we're in right relationship with God, we can sleep in the bow of the boat as the storm rages. If we're in perfect relationship with God, we could wake from that sleep and speak a word and the storm would cease. That's Jesus demonstrating our capacity for relationship with the Lord. Not God's capacity to do marvelous things. And Jesus' question is so telling. Jesus' question is so telling. Right? Check it out. He gets up, he rebukes the wind, and he says to the wind, Peace, be still. 
Notice that with a word, peace, Jesus creates the calm on the outside that exists on his inside. Right? It overflows him to calm the storm. And then he turns to the disciples and he says to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? That's an intentional word choice, I think. That's an intentional word choice. Jesus says, Why are you afraid? Have you still no? Everybody say no. No faith. That's not, that's not, do you still have a little teeny bit of faith? Or do you still have a young faith? Or do you still have a little bit of faith? Jesus says, do you still have no faith? Why does he say that? Well, to say that is, to understand that is to go back to the other parts of the passage that we had, we had them read today. I don't know if you noticed this, but as she was reading the scripture, she would stop and read the headings that are typically inserted. Just so you know, those headings aren't in the original manuscript, though. That, that, those are our way of kind of uh, separating out different sections and helping us kind of locate things, right? But those didn't appear. And, you know, as Mark's writing his gospel, he doesn't say, and now we're going to talk about the lamp on the lampstand. And now we're going to talk about the parable of the mustard seed. And now we're going to talk about how Jesus calmed the storm that one time. So we read them sort of broken up, and a lot of our, our Bibles will have these headings, but the truth is that these all flowed together, right? So, um, and it even started at the beginning with the parable of the sower. We didn't read that because I wanted to spare the youth a little bit, but he starts with the parable of the sower, and then the purpose of parables, and then we get into this lampstand business, and each of these things builds on itself. It has one thing in common, the small overtaking the large, the small becoming big, the small creating much. All right, look at, look at this. The, the lamp under a bushel does no good, but on a lampstand lights the whole house. The seed grows from a tiny seed without our effort into a plant that can be harvested for food. The mustard seed, the tiniest of seeds, we're told, gets planted in the ground and becomes the largest bush. So big, in fact, that, you know, Birds can make their nests underneath it. All along, Jesus is saying, it takes the smallest little bit of God to do the most amazing things. So when Jesus rebukes the wind and says, peace, be still, he turns to the disciples and says, have you still no faith? Because if you had just a little bit of faith, just a little bit, that tiny mustard seed of faith, this wouldn't be a problem for you. You wouldn't be afraid. You still have a little bit of faith. That's all you need. That's what Jesus says. Still, do you have no faith? But Jesus, being so filled with the presence of God, begins to have an effect on his environment, you see. Being so at peace, he could sleep in the bow in the midst of that storm. He begins to affect the actual physical environment around him. The presence of God is overflowing his life into those disciples, into the winds even, that the winds and waves would obey him. Because the presence of God, you see, is contagious. The presence of God is absolutely and utterly the most most contagious thing we can have. You know what contagious means, right? So contagious could be like, you know, you hear somebody coughing on the elevator and you can't get out of there fast enough because you don't want whatever they have, right? But imagine if someone got on the elevator with you and was you were so focused on the presence of God that they came into your presence and therefore they came into God's presence and therefore their lives began to change and they didn't even understand why. Because... God's presence is so contagious. It's like the parables that Jesus shares. The light expelling the darkness is contagious to all of those places that the light touches. You notice that the darkness is no match for the light. Wherever the light touches gets lit up. The shade of the mustard seed 
becomes the bush. And what does Jesus use to describe it? So large, puts forth branches so large that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Think of God's presence in your life as branches extending the shade that others might come to know that presence. What would it be like if anybody who encountered you couldn't help but encounter God? Do you think you could make a little more of a difference? If everyone who encountered you encountered the presence of God because you were so focused on that presence. And the awesome thing is when we do something like this, when we come together in a place like this and your focus on God's presence comes into the same atmosphere as my focus on God's presence, it begins to multiply. As Jesus says in the lamp, those who have more will be given. And those who do not have, even what they have will be taken away. That seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? Did you notice that? In the lampstand, he says, Pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For those who have, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He's comparing the spiritual to the temporal again. He's comparing when we have the presence of God, when we cultivate that presence in our lives, when we seek it out, when we make it the center of everything, it grows in us, and those that have, more will be given. But those without, eventually, will have everything they have taken from them. That's not harsh. That's just the reality. When life comes to an end, there's no more physical, right? You can't take it with you. The only thing we have is the presence of God. Our ministry together, what we do in this place, this coming together to be encouraged to seek the presence of God and then to build that presence in us and take it out where we are that those who would meet us would meet the Lord. That ministry, both individually as disciples of Jesus Christ and co collectively as the body of Christ, must begin and end with the presence of God. It cannot be reliant at all on our own competency. It has to be the overflowing presence of God in our lives. That God fills us from top to bottom and spills out over our edges that we might make a mess of everybody's life we come against. A holy, spirit-filled mess. I had some Holy Spirit-filled mess this week. It was, it was awesome. And I'm sure you guys are going to be sick of hearing about it by the end of this month, I'm sure, because I, I was tell, joking with some people that coming back from a three-day retreat that is just soaked in the Holy Spirit, I had to really be thinking carefully about how I would not turn on the fire hose and just blast all of you for like three hours today. Okay? <laughs> now, recognizing that we have constraints, you know, thanks to the National Football League and their schedule, <laughs> Just kidding. Not wanting to do that. We're going to dole out the, the inspiration that I received over this uh, three-day retreat prayerfully and hopefully well that it would be received. But the, but the truth is that I have never been more in the presence of God. I just got to tell you this. I have never in my life been more in the presence of the Lord God Almighty than I was at this three-day retreat. It was revival atmosphere. It was Holy Spirit coming upon a thousand people at once. The presence of God being so thick in that place that you could smell it, you could taste it, you could feel it. And weird things began to happen. It's funny, when God shows up, weird things begin to happen, like storms cease and ailments are healed, and languages we know not are spoken. But prayers are answered. Lives are changed. 
That presence is so powerful. That presence is so powerful. And, and as much as I could share with you about that experience, and I hope to in the days and weeks ahead, I came back with just one conviction. We need that right here. We need that kind of presence right here. We need to be united in the Holy Spirit in this place that God would wreck your lives the way he wrecked mine the last few days. And I mean wreck in a good way, by the way. That's the wrecking of all of my plans and replacing them with the Lord, right? That's, that's the way I mean that. The Lord wrecked me this week. Turned me inside out and upside down, shook me out. And set me on fire. And I want that for you. I want you to experience that. I want you to be awash in the presence of God. Not so that we can inspire you to do the next ministry or give better to the church or make sure you come on Sunday morning. None of that. I'm, I want God to just wreck your life just so that God will be the center of it. So that God could be the center of all you are. Because I'm telling you, when that happens, when that happens, you won't ever want to return to your competency. You won't ever want to turn back to what you know and what you can do. Because you will be overflowing with the presence of God doing far greater than we ever could. So I want to pray for you. Can I pray for you? I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for these shawls up here, because you see, these shawls up here represent that cushion in the midst of that storm, you see. These shawls represent that, the weightiness, the, the presence of God, a physical reminder that God is there in the midst of the storm. And if you're in the middle of a storm, I want you to take one of these at the end of the service. And if you know someone who's in the midst of their own storm, I want you to take one of these to them. And I want you to explain to them how God's presence is going to help it. That God's presence is going to change it. I want you to take one of these that God's presence would be felt. And we're going to have any leftovers available during our prayer time ministry from now on up here at the front. So don't think if you can't think of anybody right now or you're not sure you're in a storm right now, that they'll be available and they'll be right here, constantly reminding us that God's presence is with us. So I want to invite you just for a moment, just to, for those of you who can, stand. If you can't, we understand, but if you can, I just want to invite you to stand. And as a reminder that not only is God with us, but we are not alone in this, I want you to find somebody around you and just put an arm around them. Hold a hand if that's more comfortable. Put a hand on a shoulder if you can, something like that. Just a reminder that we're not alone in the midst of all of this, all right? Okay? And we're just going to pray. Can you pray with me? God, we want more of you. It's not enough for us just to come and sit and face your cross and to sing your songs, but we want more of you in this place where we call on your Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us today. That we would not only know you are God, but we would feel it. Lord, there are some here in the midst of our gathering today that are in the middle of their storm. And I pray that your presence would come upon them in mighty power right now and fill them with a peace that they cannot understand. Lord, give us open hearts that we would receive this spirit not only here, but carry it with us, Lord. Carry it into our everyday lives. Lord, come and meet us here. Lord, we ask that you would bless these shawls, these, these symbols, these opportunities for us to share your presence 
with those who are hurting. May they be a constant reminder of your blessing and your presence, even in the midst of the storms that will be calmed because we have faith. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Oh, 